Hello fight fans, I'm here with Bob Mead. Uh, Bob Mead is a boxing historian, author of uh, the book. Um, you guys are going to be really interested in Tiger Flowers book. And the book is a Tiger Flowers Rose Out of Georgia. And um, obviously I'm here with him now. How you doing Bob? Yeah, good thanks mate. Okay, great, great, great. So, um, Bob, um, so we're going to obviously start, let's, let's go, go straight into the Tiger Flower book. So, Bob, uh, but how did you go about researching Tiger Flowers and what made you be interested in it? Yeah, he was just some guy that, 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 he was a guy that I knew nothing about, really. He was just there, sandwiched in the middleweight list of champions between um, Harry Drebb and Mickey Walker, who are obviously great figures to boxing historians. I mean, I knew that Tiger Flowers existed. I knew he was called the Georgia Deacon, that he was uh, he said to be a deeply Christian man who uh, came out of the South and and, um, and won the title. I knew the basics, and uh, but I didn't really know about him. And I, I, I was idling, looking at kind of possible books and possible stories. And um, the way I do it is tend to start a book, write, I don't know, 10, 20, 30,000 words and then decide whether I feel like going on to make a book of it and more often than not I ditch it but with this one I got more and more into it and I, I suddenly realised I'd got a story I wanted to know about, I wanted to get under the surface as much as possible and, and find out a little bit more of, of what um, made Tiger Flowers the man he was, the fighter he was and, uh, and, and I also learned an enormous amount that I didn't know uh, in the process about what it was like to be black and coming out of the deep south in the first certainly two decades of the, uh, the two three decades of the last century um, like everyone else I guess I, I knew about lynchings I, I'd, I'd read the basics I understood in some vague way that it it, it, um, it was a terrible time and a terrible um, prejudice that was that was restricting so many people but as I read more and more I realized I, I, I was an innocent I didn't know the half of it I didn't know what these people um, had to deal with day after day after day and uh, you know we, that that made me feel like I wanted to tell his story even more than it to me it was becoming more than just a boxing story mm. Mm. yeah definitely I mean um He's a, he's a, he's a, he's one of the, he's one of the cases that's been thrown under, and obviously you've restored him. And uh, you know these 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 things um, need to be uncovered. And like you said, um, you know the histor it's historical the, the the stuff and what he went through. I mean, um, I mean you were saying a bit about his background, obviously he, he, deacon. So he, he became religious into the you know how, that's weird though, because how can you be, be religious and be a fire at the same time? I mean. <laughs> Yeah, his mother asked him the same searching question, and and so did the people in his church when he wanted to become a member of a of a, um, a Methodist church in in Atlanta. The congregation said, "But how can you reconcile your faith in God with a with a a, 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 a profession that that is based on violence?" Mm. And he said, "Easily, that's my job. An ambition is 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 God given, and that's what I've got." And, and he quoted um, one of the psalms uh, to them and, 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 and basically gave them a, 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 a good reason why it fitted in with his faith, that it wasn't violence, that it was sport, mm. that he was ambitious, yes, um, that was God-given, and he was there as a, as a person who would testify to, to his faith, to people who... Um, didn't necessarily encounter that kind of thing so for him it was it was something he he said blessed be the lord my strength that was the quote he used um and the, and the, that psalm goes on to talk about he teaches my hands to fight and, and in, in different context obviously but he used that to try and tell people look i can do what he saw as god's work mm. um in that profession and uh, his mother always had a problem with it I think I mean when he left home she gave him a Bible and he carried that with him all the time and uh, publicists made more of that than than they needed to make because obviously he was a rarity he was a man of, of great faith who, who didn't shy from that um, and, and uh, in a pretty strange 
world in, in, and uh, when he went to New York which was obviously uh, you're talking about the prohibition area full of gangsters full of you know individuals who um, had no principles whatsoever <laughs> uh, beyond the lining of their own pockets mm. and uh, he, he was it, it's natural that some of the the journalists of the day would would think this is too good to be true this guy is um yeah, he's a fake. There must be something in there somewhere, and they all got very cynical. And not one of them um, found anything to to suggest that he was a fake at all. And and they they liked him. They thought he was great. He was a genuine man who who um, did walk a straight life through this chaos and corruption and and the rest of it. But. I kept looking for things as well all these years on. I kept looking for hints and things that, you know, would... I didn't want to be accused of naivety, but I don't think I have been. Mm -hmm. So set, set a scene for us. So where did he come out from? Was he back and born out of slavery, West Indies? Set, set uh, a background for Right, okay. I don't want to go too much into your book because everyone wants to read it, but... <laughs> That's give, all right. Give it all. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, he... he, he he was born in 1893, I believe. The, you know, I've done research on on his birth, and his, his birth is still a, uh, a a little bit kind of in doubt because he wasn't registered. He was born to a, a poor family in in a small town called Camilla, Georgia, uh, down in Peanut and Pecan Country, and and uh, his family left there and went to the the seaport of Brunswick when he was a, a, a small boy and uh, he was one of several children um, to a, a, a kind of yeah, honest, God-fearing, poor family. Um, yeah, there would have been slavery in his background but those those people aren't on the registers. Um, yeah, we've got his, his mother and his father coming from Alabama and Georgia. Uh, we haven't got his grandparents We've got his wife's grandparents, but sometimes you just can't find these people. They're just not referred to, and they weren't living. Maybe somebody better than me will find, will unearth them. But uh, they, they were, they would have been slaves in Georgia. Mm. Um, his grandparents would have been. There's no other way. Uh, yeah, okay. Occasionally, there were freed, freed people, freed African Americans who who were. Um, able to exist mm. without being owned but there really wasn't um a great deal <laughs> they didn't they didn't lead any privileged life other than they they uh they they didn't they weren't owned and there weren't that many of those so he would have come out of slavery and i, I um it, i talk about what it was like for those people when they came out of slavery and when uh, i looked at um because his wife was educated at Tuskegee, I think that's how you pronounce it in Alabama, sorry if it's wrong, but um, his wife was at the great, first great African-American center of education um, run by Booker T. Washington uh, it, 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 when she was a girl, obviously when she was about 12 to 13 to 16, something like that. And uh, she was there. And so I, I looked at Washington and his principles because obviously she then had a great effect on her husband because he didn't have a great education. He left when he was about 12. Um, and, and Washington remembered the day of freedom he remembered when he was a boy and and he said at first there was a great outpouring of joy obviously we'd expect that and then everywhere went quiet and there was like a sober reflection and he talked about the great responsibility of being free about um, the fact that suddenly they would got the choice to do things mm. and that was a new thing and a new psychological experience for people whose parents and grandparents had perhaps lived in the same place or been sold on from somewhere else and and had no life of choice and and suddenly they would got to deal with this and it, it, it was a very strange psychological time he also talked of, of um, during the Civil War when uh, you know the, they, they were in the South, they were in Georgia um, and Alabama and Mississippi and they were on plantations and because they'd 
if they'd had um, families that had been relatively good to them mm. in the given the circumstances and had treated them fairly in context, um, they felt something for them. They felt a responsibility for them. They had their place in society. And, and the, he remembered that their family were desperately sad when one of the sons of uh, the white owners was maimed or, or, or um, killed in, in the Civil War. And that man was fighting to keep them in slavery. But they still felt um, a, a sadness. Hmm. And and it was a very complex time, and I was trying to understand this, and trying to understand what made. Um, you, we all come out of our grandparents, our, our parents, their experience, what they've gone through, and that would have been the same for him. And I don't know who his grandmother and grandfather were, but he would have known. And maybe that then becomes relevant. That's what I felt anyway, and and. Uh, then obviously there was the period of reconstruction where people tried to rebuild, found it impossible, and then in comes the, um, the hard stuff, the original uh, clan so, and the vigilante yeah. groups. Yeah, from, and from the Civil War, yeah. <laughs> yeah, after that there was a period of reconstruction when they tried to kind of get the country going, mm. but you know, it, it wasn't, it, it didn't work. And, and um, the number of black people who, who voted went down viciously, you know, dramatically mm. from, from the 1870s and 1880s to the end of the century. It dropped because people were intimidated because it was, it was um, a time of great difficulty and the lynchings began or, or increased and, and white uh, loose white groups of vigilantes or disadvantaged people or um, whatever were were making life extremely difficult and obviously that worsened and um, I tried to go into that and put that in context so that you can see what he was coming out of mm -hmm. but it, it was it was something that we can only really get a stab at now and I've done my best with it, but that's for others to judge. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. We we'll go into that, that. I mean, you set the scene for the background of obviously, like what you said, obviously slavery and civil war, and obviously a prejudice and stuff like that. So how did he? So what, under uh, under all them things, and how did he become a boxer then? I mean, yeah, he he was he met a heavyweight called Rufus Cameron, and he was working in in um, Brunswick and he was newly married. He'd just married his wife, Willie May, in the uh, autumn of 1915, and he was 22. She was four years younger, I think, and uh, from memory, sorry. And uh, they, they'd got no money. They were, he was just doing a job for a dollar, a dollar a day down at the docks, or um, trying his best, but they had no prospects. And somehow he met a heavyweight called Rufus Cameron, who was uh, born in Texas, but then found his way to Los Angeles. And, and he was a kind of second-rate guy. You know, he, he lost to the best fighters. Uh, but he made a living, and he travelled, and he, w he went to Mexico, and he, he'd gone across America for boxing. And he, he offered to give him a lesson, and Flowers was hooked. According to his wife, Flowers was hooked straight away, and he, he thought, this is what I want to do. And, um, you know, maybe he thought that uh, he, Cameron had earned more money. Cameron was, I don't know... Cameron's personality, but he was certainly outgoing. Uh, he was certainly, you, know, you can imagine that this small town kid with it, working on a dollar a day suddenly saw this guy come in who travelled, who'd had good money in his pocket, and and um, was interested, and and was physically very 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 fit anyway, and wanted to learn. And he, he there was a biography written of him just after his death when he was famous, you know, which was a big a big deal at the time, but obviously he's not, uh, his name doesn't mean the same now, but um, in that, his wife was 
talking uh, through the author. Her voice is very, very clear in that. It's almost like parts of it are her story, not the not the author's. And and she said he he was hooked from the beginning, and he would get up before work, and he would train, and he'd go out into the garden, and he he'd punch his bag that he'd hung up on the washing line or something, and he'd, he'd just trained phenomenally hard from the beginning he was dreaming already and it was when a neighbor who called him tiger because his proper name was theodore and uh, she she was uh, she was um, having a laugh at his expense that he was always out, always outside and she said he you know uh, look at that guy he's out there he's he you've got a tiger there mrs flowers <laughs> and, <laughs> and it stuck and uh, one of the others suggested that he should go he, she should get him get him um, get him locked up because he quite, quite clearly wasn't right in the head he was always outside hitting this bag and doing whatever Cameron had told him to do mm. so he was hooked on it from the start you know get some your skin doesn't it it's just for the game yeah <laughs> we, we all know we all bugged <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and um so yeah so you i mean you know really said that. and i mean at the time when he started going so, so to see the guy who who taught him uh, was it like did he come out the bare knuckle area or he, he was talking at the glove because i remember we talking to um colin alcott he's saying the gloves then they were full of horse feather so i don't know maybe his yeah. gloves are a bit more padded <laughs> i mean they were basically yeah. like gloves <laughs> They would have fought in all kinds of places where they did have gloves. It wasn't the bare knuckle era, it was after that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the gloves may well have been pretty rudimentary things that, you know, um, yeah, especially some of the fights they uh, they had, some of the places they fought in. Um, there was like a, a carousel for black fighters. They'd go and fight in front of black audiences. And, and it, you know, it was like... You know, education for the African American people was deprived. Yeah, they got schools, but nobody cared about them. No, nobody gave them good equipment. And you could probably say the same for for the um, the, the, the 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 kind of circuit of, of that the African American fighters of the time trod mm. when they were uh, they weren't given um, anything to to really help them. And the, you can imagine, can't you, that the, some of the gloves would have been pretty, pretty ropey things. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, another thing I was going to ask you. So, how did he, like, at the time? Okay, so the year we're talking about, black fighters didn't really fight white fighters. It was, it was just becoming a bit. I mean, obviously, after the Jack Johnson, they're getting used to it. So he, he's fighting, uh, um, fighting, um, obviously, white. How, when do you feel like he could get this? Because I'm not, I'm, I'm looking at his resume, and he fought Harry Greb. A young Bob Foster. I don't know if it was the the, the proper Bob Foster. No, no. The Bob Fitzsimmons. Sorry, Bob Fitzsimmons. No. And he fought Mickey Walker. Well, okay, it wasn't. Yes, that's right. Yeah, he, yeah, he did fight white fighters, in, 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 no, and some states allowed it. Mm. Um, it. It took time. Each state had its own rules. Mm. And um, but even as late as 1925, the the mixed fights, as they called them, were um, temporarily banned in California, which is supposedly one of the most enlightened states. Mm. And and it was unheard of and un, un, unthinkable in the Deep South that that the black and white would mix. Yeah. I go into this stuff in in the book where yeah. there are. Uh, uh, I mean, there was a violent reaction against any suggestion that that would happen. It did occasionally happen, and and a fight would be stopped by some kind of local hmm. person who thought that he had the authority to stop it because, you know, the black guy might have been winning. Or and and one of the most famous fighters of the time in, uh, in Georgia was a guy called Young Stribling, um, a white fighter. Uh, from Macon, Georgia, who who uh, eventually boxed um, for the uh, light heavyweight and heavyweight titles, um, didn't win them, um, and and he he was he was young, but he was a contemporary of of, of Flowers, and they were both famous at the same time, and he was the one man that Flowers said, I can't fight him even when they were in New York and all that was in the past that Flowers would fight anybody and most people were accepting him. There were still the odd people who you know, wouldn't fight him, but he, he said, I'll fight anybody. I won't fight Stribling because if I beat him, if I'm lucky enough to get a fair shake of it and they give me a decision, I don't want that, the repercussions to happen to my people in, in, 
at home. I don't want oh. my family to suffer. Wow. Whoa. And, oh. Yeah, this is this was bad stuff. Wow. Um, there was an incident. Was... Sorry, there was an incident when Stribling fought the white Irish light heavyweight champion Mike McTeague in in Georgia, and McTeague tried to pull out of the fight, and the promoter got him and his manager into a room and said, "You see those two trees there? We've got enough rope. You pick the tree. You can go on there." Oh. Oh. And they were white, so. Oh. That's um, a, that's a this was a bad place. Is that yeah, the, so shriveling what, was affiliated with gangsters or just a No, 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 it was just, just the way things were. Oh, okay, yeah. And, and, and the, the, you know, black people could not walk down the street and look at, uh, you know, let their eyes rest on a man, a white man's wife. Mm -mm. They couldn't, I mean, there was an incident of a man, which I quoted in the book, of a man being lynched because um, a three-year-old child picked up a nickel that he dropped, he took it back, and they lynched him huh. because he'd taken his own money back from a, a child, a white child, and and stuff like that. You could walk down the street and be arrested for nothing, um, and and you would go into a um, forced labour camps basically. They, 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 there was a woman. I mean, I'm digressing, but this is how hard it was. Um, and how careful you had to be mm. and he wasn't he wasn't messing around when he said he wouldn't fight stribbling mm. there was a woman arrested for adultery um, an african-american woman ad uh, arrested for adultery in in georgia uh, she was put in a cell uh, the sheriff refused to prosecute her because they found out that the man she was accused of adultery with was her husband um, that didn't matter to the justices they found her guilty uh, a guy came in on cue and said, I'll pay a fine, and in return for that, you've got to work for me. She didn't know what was going on, and was before she knew it, she was taken away and in a labour camp, and her family had no idea where she was, and she'd gone, and gone into a system. And then they could sell you on, and you could end up anywhere. And I, I've quoted various things like that in the book, which, you know, <laughs> that's, that's the sort of thing that was happening that's why he would never fight stribbling that's why um we have to understand that that um it was remarkable that this man came out of that situation to become world middleweight champion yeah yeah i mean i mean yeah i mean um i'm looking at also looking at his box record that there's a guy called orton towels joe gans it's not the original joe gans no no that's right that was a, that wasn't him that was a different guy uh, that, that's right that was allentown joe gans from um, pennsylvania another black fighter on the circuit mm. um these guys just worked a circuit often fighting each other many many times moving from town to town but um flowers was so popular so he put his, himself on the line that he drew audiences, first among black audiences, but then also mixed audiences. And, and in the states where he could fight white people, uh, and the fighters, I think, pretty much like today, you know, the, you go inside the game and, and the issues of colour of skin matter a hell of a lot less. And the, the, boxers are boxers. And they, they had most of those had no trouble fighting at all. So where they could, they put the fights on. And he grew, he grew more and more popular, and he, he got a kind of momentum going. But to do that, he had to cover thousands and thousands of miles by rail and road um, to do it, fighting way too often mm. uh, for his own health. But he just kept on going until he broke through. Mm, mm. I can see the one year they they racking up a, a loads of fights and like as like I pointed out to um, to the viewers that the, the obviously the gloves they wasn't padded like they are now these days. There's, like I said, they're probably full of horse fair, horse horse hair in there, and um, you know you obviously had to and obviously the stuff he was in jury had to be a very strong willed man. Um, so you know let's go let's go on to the, um, the, the the Harry Greb fight. You know, the Harry Greb fight when he obviously got his chance to get the shot title. So. How did he go about getting the shot of the title and um, against Harry Right, Griffin? yeah, he, he fought 
the guy I mentioned earlier in the interview, Mike McTeague, who'd been light heavyweight champion, who was a, a tough guy, a, a bit of a spoiler, who'd had bad hands, didn't fight as often as he used to, and, and they wanted a charity night. Um, uh, and, uh, just just before Christmas in um, 1925, and, and at Madison Square Garden, they they made a fight. They didn't really want between Mike McTeague and Tiger Flowers, and Flowers was popular, but um, McTeague was going to spoil all night. They they worried that it wouldn't be a good fight for their their punters, but it was the only thing they could get. And uh, when it came to it, Flowers. Apparently, there's no film of it, but Flowers, according to reports, just out outworked McTeague, who didn't want to be there really, who just did what he was necessary, did what was necessary, and got through the fight. That's the impression you get anyway. Um, and and McTeague just got through it, survived, countered, fiddled, and and got the decision. And there was an outcry, there was an outrage amongst all the reporters at ringside. Pretty much all of them were saying, this is a complete disgrace, it's an embarrassment. Uh, you know, we think we get bad decisions now. Well, they had them then as well. And, and almost as a reaction, Flowers became, got, got huge sympathy from that. And the great promoter, Tex Rickard, liked him because he gave value yeah. and made the Greb fight. Wow. He got them both together and made it. Greb, Greb was a great, great fighter who, who never had a problem with, with um, he didn't care who he fought. He'd fight anybody, and he, he never barred a black fighter. Mm. And he, he, he was the sort of guy who would have fought Jack Dempsey. He wanted to fight Jack Dempsey, the heavyweight champion, who was pretty much feared at the time. Greb didn't fear him. He, he, he'd have fought him. He bust him up in sparring, and um, you know he didn't care. And so it, it, by then, to be fair to Greb's reputation, now he was struggling. He was almost blind, and he was on his last you know, stretch of his career, and um, and Flowers got him at the right time. But they had fought before in a, in a no decision, non title fight, and reports are conflicting. You know, there are some people thought Greb had won it. There were others who thought Flowers won it. But um, difficult to tell. And and the, you know, the, the, enough thought Flowers won it to make a case for him winning the, re the, the, the return for the championship when it did come yeah. and, and Flowers fought out of his skin you know didn't stop throwing punches kept doing what he does um, the, the reports suggest he was just as unorthodox and and um, uh, unpredictable as Greg was sorry Greb was without the fouls Greb was a, a, a legend for for taking the law into his own hands he saw referees as interfering policemen and didn't appreciate their presence in the ring at all so he liked to do what he wanted and Flowers um, would match him if he was fouled he wouldn't put up with it but at one at one point he, he stood back and says uh, is, is alleged to have said um, Mr. Greb, I don't really mind you fouling me all night long, but please don't take the Lord's name in vain. <laughs> and <laughs> Greb stopped swearing from that moment on. He said, I just burst out laughing and I couldn't swear. You know, what was the point? And, and fouling, what's the point in that? Because the guy was with me all the way. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was a hard, hard 15 round fight. And maybe as a reaction to the McTeague decision, Flowers got the verdict. You know, it was very, very close. And he got a split decision, mm. and he won the middleweight championship. And, of course, Georgia went mad. White and black celebrated his victory in Georgia. They, you know, he, he, he was one of theirs, mm. and they recognized that. And they recognized his, his, um, his character. Mm. He wasn't Jack Johnson who provoked people into outrage by parading white women all around all over the place and doing what he wanted. A di ho wholly different character and um, obviously a, a very admirable one in very many ways. But the reaction he had was to um, cause problems and Flowers wasn't like that. Uh, people respected what he was and that he'd invested his money in, in institutions in Georgia, in, in Atlanta, where he was living by then. And uh, he and his wife were 
straightforward, ordinary Christian people, so he'd got a lot of support. When he won the title, people were glad for him. Mm. Well, you're actually very surprised when you when you said that white and black was a remember of Joe Lewis. I think maybe he may have helped in, in the whole thing with Joe Lewis. I mean, he, he won the title around when Joe Lewis was just coming onto the scene. I mean, maybe... Um, yeah, I think he did. Yeah. I think he formed a bridge between Johnson and Lewis and fighters, later fighters like Ray Robinson and, and, and the baseball star Jackie Robinson, maybe even Jesse Owens who, who won those golds in the 1936 Olympics, although he was an amateur, um, you know, he got his chances. If I think Flowers is his is contribution to um, sporting culture in America is is, is vastly underrated, has been forgotten. It's mm. been forgotten that he broke barriers. Yeah. with his own character. Yeah, because they will say Joe Lewis, but obviously he's before Joe Lewis's time and obviously Jack Lawson did provoke a lot a lot of people and because a lot of thing a lot of fight films was lost. I don't know maybe that's probably why the Tiger Flowers film was probably lost, but a lot of fight film was banned. In the, yeah, that's right. The, um the the Jack Johnson fight uh, um yeah, the, 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 there was a law in in <sighs> Well, I think the whole yeah, it was a federal law in the um, in the, that banned the transportation of films, mm. and and therefore um, films of of Johnson were uh, even when he lost the title against Jess Willard, the movie wasn't seen, and that's why Johnson was able to say, "Oh, I lay down." It was a fix, mm. and nobody could see the foot of the film at the time. It did exist, but um, in the end. It wasn't seen until the late fifties. Yeah, and and so um, that that was it, 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 people didn't see these it, these um, things happen for themselves. But Tiger Flowers, they did make a movie. His his, his manager, Walk Miller, mm. made a, um, a a documentary that was shown in theaters. Um, a, a fairly fictitious thing, I would imagine. Walt Miller was a publicist as well as a manager, and he did a uh, did his job of promoting Flowers to the the championship. But um, yeah, it would have been interesting now to see the film. Yeah. But um, all copies appear to have been lost, and if there any have survived, I guess the film has deteriorated to the point where it, it would be unviewable. That's the general view mm. now, and and the, the same with the footage of his fights. Shame, it's a shame. But like I said, um, I mean, um, like you said, obviously you bringing up the book, and that it will, it will start some interest. I mean, I mentioned it to to Clean Alcott, and there's a book on Tiger Fire. She was very interested. Was like, oh, I didn't know that. It was interesting. Maybe I can get you two talking um, at some yeah. point. Yeah, you know. I, yeah, that'd be fun. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because are, are, are you on are you on Skype? No, I'm not. Oh, okay, it's a shame because he's on Skype as well. But we'll, we'll sort about that. We'll talk about that after the interview. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. So yeah, let's talk about. Um. So he had a rematch again after he won the battle, and every so obviously that George is all proud of him, which is like the only time I remember that when you know obviously the time was when uh, Joe Lewis. But so he had a rematch with him, and then he lost the title to Mickey Walker. How? What? What went about that for him to lose his title against uh, Mickey Walker? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, he beat Greb again and ended Greb's career. Greb then died uh, on an operating table in Atlantic City, um, and and uh, he defended his title against Mickey Walker. Mm. Flowers went to Chicago, um, and his manager agreed a deal with uh, Walker's extremely wily manager Jack Doc Kearns, who'd managed Jack Dempsey. Mm. Uh, to his his great years, and uh, he couldn't get more contrasting figures than Mickey Walker and and, and Doc Kearns and and um, Walt Miller and particularly Tiger Flowers. I mean, Kearns and Walker were guys who inhabited every night spot in whatever city they could get, and they didn't sleep, and they they uh, loved. Um, parading themselves around and, and spending money they didn't have and spending every bit of money they did have and, and enjoying themselves hugely and, and Flowers obviously was the complete opposite to that but Kearns knew the bad side of life far better than Flowers could ever do and his manager was um, not made of his cloth but was, was certainly an outsider in that world and Kearns knew Al Capone which is where the suspicions come in, the fight was in Chicago. Mm. Um, 
it, 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 it was close again. I mean, it, it, most people thought Flowers had won. Most reporters that I, uh, most reports that I've seen, suggested Flowers had won, and won in spite of two flash knockdowns, which didn't count the way they do now. You didn't get a 10-8 round for those. It was just you may not even get the round. People didn't worry so much if somebody just hit the crown with a bump, jumped straight back up, and got on with it. Um, and, and most people thought that Flowers had won the fight, but he didn't get it. He lost it. There was a referee, no judges, and at the end, Walker had got it. And there was speculation around that it was a Capone-influenced decision, that there was a lot of money riding on Walker. And, um, you know, it maybe that's, that was the case. And certainly he thought... He would get another chance. It was contract. A rematch clause was contracted, but they just ignored it. Um, they didn't want to know. They'd got the title. Flowers didn't matter anymore. They could do what they wanted, and uh, they, you know, he spent the rest of his career and life waiting for his chance to get uh, to get his title back. Yeah. But it wasn't going to happen. Yeah. And uh, they, 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 it's it's ironic that. Um, Walker was ordered to defend against him uh, at the time when he died. Mm. But whether it would have ever happened, we still can't know because Kearns could have pulled some strings and done what he did best and manipulated and manoeuvred. And um, yeah, it, it, it was. They were out of their depth in that kind of society, and his title was never going to be his for a long time, I don't think. Mm. He, he reigned for ten months, and that wasn't bad. Mm. But then he spent the next year back on the road mm. yeah. until it caught up with him. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, so this is a this is a first. Like, so he wins against Harry Griff and repeats the thing. And these are these are like fifteen rounders. Then he goes to Chicago, gets Mickey Walker, and it's a ten rounder. Yeah. Why would he? Well, they have different rules for different states. Oh, okay. okay. And and. Um, the fight was made over 10 rounds. I can't remember what the Illinois rules were without looking back. Um, sorry, it's a while since I wrote it. But certainly in some states, they only allowed 10 rounders. Whether Kearns and and, um, and Walt Miller agreed 10 rounds and didn't have to, uh, well, you know, that, that's, that's, uh, uh, it, that would be typical of, of um, Miller's naivety to agree to something like that. Mm. But Kearns would know that the lighter man had a better chance over a shorter distance. Yeah. the referee, I'm, I'm looking at um, on Boxer right now. I said the referee, Ben Younger, said that the decision was based for Walker because he was he was hitting the cleaner punches and Flower was, was only throwing slaps with open yeah. gloves. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's uh, a, a thing that was levelled against him, that he did slap, mm. but... He threw so many punches that they weren't all slaps. Mm. And, and the rules were different then. Mm. Some states allowed it, some didn't. Some even allowed backhanders, which they don't do now. And he threw punches from everywhere, and he was on top of you all the time. And um, that's an old argument, isn't it? We've heard that one many, many a time from a, 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 a referee. Um, yeah, but he threw the cleaner punches. Yeah, you know what's amazing. Yeah. You know what's amazing to me as I'm looking at record. I'm not too sure. I don't think he ever got knocked out. And even when he finished his career, unlike most fighters, he finished his career on a win. He, he, was, he was winning fights. He seemed like uh, he probably just maybe lost out of interest. But he, he looked like he was. He did. Yeah. He, well, he fought. His last fight was um, uh, against a 200-pound heavyweight called Leo Gates. Yeah. Um, and he he repeatedly conceded huge amounts of weight and unfortunately that that you know it was a hard way of life and and it took his toll he'd got scar tissue he'd been having headaches he dizzy spells and he he was they, people then didn't know what we know now about the cost of boxing about the cost of getting hit in the head mm. hard and often and he he took shots he must have done over that number of fights you know he fought when he he was still bruised and sore from the previous week maybe when he was still cut a little bit he just carried on and and eventually it caught up with him and he had um scar tissue forming lumps of gristle on his on his face above his eyebrows particularly above the right eyebrow 
and he got the dizzy spells and they put it down to sinus problems which um, <laughs> possible but unlikely um, that it would cause the discomfort that he was having completely I, I, I think he was suffering from the effects of his career but obviously he can't prove it so they, they put him in for um, a, a, a hospital uh, operation in a clinic not a hospital of a, of a respected New York surgeon um, called Wilford Freilich uh, in in 1927, in November 27, just after he'd had his last fight. And um, it was supposed to be routine. It was supposed to be just a, a question of removing the gristle but um, and, and repairing his face. But it, it was supposed to be so minor that he didn't even tell his wife about it. And... Uh, it, <laughs> You know, she was back in Georgia. He went under the knife in New York, and he died the same day. Uh, he, uh, he he died without ever really recovering from the the um, the surgery, and uh, that was then sparked off the the, um, the 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 terrible morning, and and um, yeah, his life had ended suddenly and 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 dreadfully and there were a lot of repercussions. I've gone into the book, in, into Freilich's um, mm. competence level, and I don't, I think there were holes in his his uh, reputation that suggested he shouldn't have been anywhere near handing out anaesthetic when they didn't really know what they were doing. Mm. And uh, there were a lot of people at the time who said, um, if it was a, a black medical team working with him, he wouldn't have died. But the fact that 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 was a that was the response of, of African American writers, put it like that, and they were very angry, very anguished, um, and uh, <laughs> there were a lot of recriminations, but nobody got anywhere. Uh, but they didn't know that Freilich had um, the deficiencies that I suggest in the book were the case. Yeah. Uh, I won't go into them in here, but uh, you know, I think there's enough evidence to suggest he was a bit of a charlatan, and uh, you know that that was the the tragedy that his life ended when maybe it, it, it shouldn't have done. It didn't need to. Certainly, it didn't need to. Um, a proper competent doctor, I think, would have would have um, treated him differently. Mm. But there we go. You know that that's in the book, and so is the aftermath of the death when he was taken back to his body was taken back to Georgia and given he was given a huge funeral um, that almost befitted a, a politician, a great statesman rather than a fighter. Uh, there, there was general mourning and general regret, and um, and then uh, it's without giving the whole story away his manager then turned from being in another dramatic twist the, the, the manager turned from being the guy he thought of as a friend the guy who'd who'd been with him all that time um, suddenly tried to take possession of his estate and tried to put his wife in an asylum and his daughter in an orphanage uh, by stealing his money, basically, wow. by trying to take his money, and and um, that that's a twist that that uh, you know the book covers, huh. and um, and the, the uh, African American journalists of the time uh, quite rightly came out in force and and did manage to save the the house from his manager. And save his possessions, um, and and but they still, they were still forced out, mm. and forced away from their home by some kind of white racist pressure. In the end, that probably wouldn't have happened if if Tiger Flowers had lived. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, Swiss as well. You know, it's got me. It's got me gripped. Me. I'm 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 looking to go and find a book. And I reckon everyone listening to you is probably <laughs> gonna go and we'll definitely go and, and read it, read um read up on this book and read up about this historical man and, and his historical life and boxing which is which uh, a lot of people obviously missed and with you <laughs> this this um I'm actually very uh, I have a lot to say at this but <laughs> it's got me it's got you gripped. I can see why you went and researched it and, and things. It's a it's a tragic but it's a, it's a tragic story, but um 
these sort of things happen in in, in the fight game, and um, yeah, he was he was a, he was a great man. I mean, he's obviously going to remember as an all time great. It's a shame. It's a shame the way it ended, man. It's a shame. It's a shame. I'm, 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 I hope someone finds the fight for you. Maybe it is um, been um, you know maybe it is thing, but maybe you never know. Someone can come out with that footage. I mean, they're the Yeah, maybe. Yeah. We can all dream of seeing him. It would be great to see him. I think if we did, stars have changed so much that we'd probably think, wow, he was different. But I think as, as agricultural as his style might seem to us now, he was a southpaw who threw punches from everywhere and anywhere. The thing that would come through was the work rate, the kind of nature of his... his, his um, the, 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 the fact that the man put it, put himself on the line mm. so much that he, he attracted people to see him because mm. he gave value all the time, every fight. Mm. Mm. And, uh, yeah, great fighter. And I, I, I feel privileged to have at least attempted to have told his story. Yeah. Um, I think all books like this are abandoned, not finished, because you can never, ever get far enough. But I've... I've um, tried my best and I hope people like it or at least are interested in it yeah well yeah definitely definitely well Bob man um, <laughs> is there anything else that you, you want to share with, with a guy that you feel like um, that you know anything you, you know you didn't want to share or you didn't get the chance to say ask guy about the book or do you think we've discovered everything that you might say because I know I've been prompting you about questions that anything you might want to get out about the book or anything or no, I think that it, it, it's there for people to find, it's there for people to see. Um, uh, you know, I have some available, and, and if people want to contact me through Twitter or something, um, I, I guess you say that your Twitter is BobMe1. If somebody wants to um, contact me for a signed copy, they're very welcome. Um, otherwise, you know, if you find your story interesting, then please look further. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I feel that um, there, will, there will there will have been more to it than I can get to because mm. I'm writing so much longer. Uh, I did try to contact his family. I did have contact with them. Um, there's a, a piece in the book about how that went, and um, I'm very pleased with the help that I did have, but I feel great frustration that um, perhaps without telling you the ends of the book that the that I didn't get far enough um, with that and um, maybe in future if any member of Tiger Flower's family and descendants now have any family stories to tell there's a there's a, there's a uh, for maybe a later edition that could be added in and maybe reworked but um, that would be very welcome if anybody did want to do that but um, yeah, it, it's been a privilege to write it, and I'm, I'm glad I have. Yeah, I'm, well, I we, we are as well, and it's been a privilege you coming down and, and coming to the YouTube boxing community and, and talking to about that. I'm going to put your Twitter handle underneath and uh, how people can contact you. And um, yeah, man, it's, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a great listen, and um, yeah, I enjoyed it very much. Um, yeah, so okay, <laughs> all right, then I, I'm, I'm going to sign out then. All right, and fight fans. Um, hopefully, um, we get to talk Bob Mead again. Maybe with uh, uh, with Clean Elcott. Oh, that'd be great. Oh, I'd enjoy that. And um, yeah, um, yeah. Thanks very much, Bob. And um, we we'll catch you on the next one. Sure. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Okay then. Bye.